Cash Flow Diary Podcast, Episode 19. Congratulations, you showed up. Give yourself a high five in celebration of your success. Welcome to the Cash Flow Diary, where new and experienced investors come to take confident action towards their goals. Your host is a family man, a real estate entrepreneur, investor, coach, and instructor. As a master facilitator of Robert Kiyosaki's Cash Flow 101 game, he's inspired many to begin their journey into creating cash flow for themselves and their family. And now, here he is to offer you the tools required to earn the income desired. Your cash flow coach, Jay Massey. Well, hello there. Welcome. Glad that you're back one more time. I am excited uh, because many of you may have already noticed, but if you haven't, go over to learninvestingnow.com. Not only now are we teaching you how to be able to be able to buy and sell real estate using none of your own money and credit with an ebook. It's an entire e-course. Uh, when it's all said and done, you should receive about 30 different emails that are going to walk you through the process step by step of what you need to do, how you need to think, and what you need to say to get stuff done. Uh, I did, you know, a number, it's, it's hours upon hours of video, and it's all free, guys. Go for it. Anyway, learn investing now. Place your email in the box. Start receiving your ebook and course immediately. I'm excited about that. Don't know if you knew about that, but now you do. Anyway, uh, and for those of you listening for the first time, welcome to the Cashflow Diary podcast. Uh, listen to episode one if you want to understand a little bit more about the background, who I am, etc. if you care about that type of thing. And as a request for the thousands of you that we can tell that are listening, uh, it would be very, very nice if any of you, all of you actually, would go and leave a positive comment about the show in iTunes simply because we want to be able to be found by more and more people. If you have heard anything, anything from me uh, that has been encouraging or that has helped you in some way, shape, or form, feel free to please go over to iTunes, comment about it, let other people know that we're here because it helps us in the rankings to be found. All right, so uh, today we're going to talk about how to get, or how do I get investors to believe in me and want to invest. I know that's a very common question that I get at live events and I get uh, from, you know, people all across the world, honestly, in many different forms and fashions. And I want to see if I can address some of those things today to do our best to help you be equipped uh, mentally, emotionally, physically, uh, spiritually, whatever to go out there and get some business done. Before we go there, uh, we're going to have our cash flow quote. And it simply uh, comes to us from an individual you may have actually heard of before, which is good. It's try not to become a man of success, but rather try to become a man of value. And that comes to us from Mr. Albert Einstein. Uh, if you don't know who he is, uh, he's a German-born theoretical physicist who developed the general theory of relativity. So really, really, really smart guy. If you've ever seen the equation E equals MC squared, it's been dubbed the world's most famous equation, even though most people can't remember what E equals MC squared is actually for. Uh, even if you did take it in school, it doesn't matter. At the end of the day, um, it is just know that What's important is to become a man of value and or a woman of value. Okay, ladies, I know you're out there too. Uh, we get your emails. And I just wanted to say that the key here is to understand that value is where it's at. The key is to understand, you know, what is of value. And in fact, it leads into a lot of what it is that we're going to talk about uh, today. Well, uh, you may have also noticed that we are coming up on episode 20. Episode 20 is the 10 episode mark where we begin to uh, answer your questions. We have received some, love to receive some more questions uh, on, because those questions are what we're going to answer uh, all next episode. Uh, if you have a question uh, regarding real estate or business, um, send it in to questions at cashflowdiary.com. Again, that's questions with an S, at cashflowdiary.com. Okay, so let's jump right into it. Uh, when it comes down to, quote-unquote, getting investors to believe in you and wanting to invest, 
one of the fundamental things that I think, you know, sidetracks a number of people is that you start talking immediately about the property and the project or the deal or whatever it is that you want to call it. And for some reason, um, the general consensus is that's like the most important thing and what you must begin doing first. Well, first and foremost, one of the things that I've learned uh, is that at the end of the day, even though you are raising capital or using other people's money, whatever you want to call it, it's still a sale. Okay, you're still selling something. And what I've learned is that most people don't know what they're selling. Uh, they think they're selling a deal. And that's not a, the entire truth. Uh, that's that's actually the the one of the most interchangeable parts and sometimes even the least important piece. So there are some basic fundamental rules that you must remember to follow in this case. So one of them is that you can't force anyone to do anything that they don't want to do. I can't force them. I don't have any magic and neither do you. And it's wrong to try to do so. So just the thinking of how do I get investors to believe in you? You, you, you don't get them because a, a wise man once said, a man convinced against his will is of the same opinion still. You and I can't convince people. We can influence them. We can give them reasons that we think they should. But at the end of the day, it has to be their decision. So understand this. You, you can't force it. So don't be thinking because I, I know one of the things that hurt me for a long time in this business or in sales or in entrepreneurship in general was thinking I had to come up with the magic words to say in order to get people to buy or do whatever it is that I needed them to do so that I could eat, right? Because, you know, a salesperson, if you don't sell, you don't eat. That's kind of the whole adage, right? And the, the truth of the matter is it's so little about what to say and so much more about what to ask because we're going to get to the next piece here. Each person purchases for their own reasons. Each person purchases for their own reasons. See, what it comes down to is you and I, when we buy something, we buy it for our own reasons. Now, some of those reasons may have been given to us by the person, quote unquote, selling it, but that doesn't mean they convinced us. It does mean that we agreed with some of the reasons that they suggested we purchase. OK, now, when you are out there looking for people and investors and partners and lenders and all this other stuff, your job now that you are the entrepreneur is to uncover why, why you and why now. And here's what I mean. When you're out there, you, you've got to uncover from your potential or prospective investor, why on earth would they want to invest in general, like what is it that they like about investing? What what are they seeking? Uh, what are they hoping that real estate will do for them? That's one of my favorite questions to ask is, you know, what are you hoping is the eventual outcome from this? Here's another way of asking that question. Um, if we were having this conversation 12 months from today, what would you like to be able to say has happened between now and then? I love that because it helps to uncover why people are willing to do what it is that are, that needs to be done to make these things work. And you say, well, my deal's longer than 12 months. Okay, that's fine. Then put in, you know, what, however long the deal is. You know, why, you know, five years from today, 50 years from today, it doesn't really matter. The point is, ask the question. And then you also want to find out why you. Like, why on earth? I mean, let's be real. They have options. Everybody has options. That's one of the greatest things about a free market, right, is options. So you want to know why on earth do they want to deal with you? Why would they? And you should know why they should want to, but you need to know why they agree and why they are willing to deal with you. That's one of the fundamental things, because I think what happens is that we get afraid or concerned that we're going to say, or they're going to say no, and we don't want to hear the word no. So we spend all this time trying to trick them to say yes. <laughs> when the truth of the matter is, in my opinion, everyone wants to say yes, but they're more willing or the, they would rather say no when they're afraid. And when you begin asking questions and making sure that they're solid on why you, it lessens their fear and gives them the freedom to say yes. 
And that's honestly what I think a lot of people want. Um, you must also uncover, as I said, why now? Because there's a reason. And you need to understand what that reason is. Here's, here's what I mean by that. Sometimes when you're working uh, with a potential investor, you have the challenge that they've been considering real estate for a long time. And that's the challenge, considering. They haven't taken action. You need to know why now. You know, uh, I've sat in with people of all kinds, of all different, you know, uh, socioeconomic classes, all kinds of different various capacities in terms of funds, etc. And I'm always going to ask, why now? You know, if you have a, you know, you got a quarter of a million dollars right now, how long have you had it? And why are you willing to use it now? I mean, what's changed? You've had it sitting in this, you know, certificate of deposit for five years. Why you why change that? That seems to have been working for you, you know, and I know that question may seem like it's obvious to you, but and it may be, but you need to know what their reason is. Never assume. Uh, assuming is so dangerous. And it's what you think, you know, that that kills the deal. You need to understand why they are willing to do what it is that you know that they need to do in order to be a part of your transaction. Okay, here's the next piece. Um, understand that when you are talking to an investor uh, of any kind, it's an exchange of value. It's an exchange of value. As I was alluding to in the cash flow quote earlier, it's an exchange of value. You must remember this. Give more in use value than you take in cash value. I'll say that again. Give more in use value than you take in cash value. So that presupposes that you understand what your value in the use equation is. I mean, you're saying, well, I'm not bringing any value. I'm just trying to get the deal done. That's not true. See, um, cash, currency, money, whatever term you want to use, is just one tool necessary in the chain of value. It's only one tool, and it's the most readily available tool, all right? And it is your job to position yourself, your company, in such a way as such that you're not a commodity. Because this is typically what happens, is uh, the new investor forgets or doesn't know that they're not a commodity. And then they start trying to pitch a deal on things like, well, this return on investment is higher, so therefore you got to have this one. And that's so not the case. <laughs> there are so many other things that are of value than just, you know, ROI. Now, I'm not saying ROI isn't important and can be totally ignored. I'm saying that there are other things that are more important than the return on investment. And your deal may have better numbers, but there are other reasons why someone's choosing not to invest with you. And understand that cash is just one tool that is necessary. Some of the other pieces of the chain of value in this case is, you know, and by far uh, the biggest, in my opinion, is your team. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that later. But one of the things is to understand that, well, how do I say this? It's really not all about you anyway. But I digress. We're going to pick, we're going to pick up that piece here uh, again and talk some more about that. But uh, what is also part of the exchange of value is understanding that their, you know, funds are could be doing other things. So what does that mean? That means they could choose to do an annuity. They could choose to do life insurance. They could choose to do stocks and bonds, etc. So, but you're giving more in use value than you take in cash value. Some of the things that you bring to the table that those other asset classes don't is an element of control. So don't neglect that. Uh, just don't neglect that because there is a significant value to being in control or having more control or being closer to the control mechanisms uh, when it comes to your cash and what it is that it's doing. So that's one of the big pieces. Here's the next reason uh, that I think if you begin to understand this concept, it will help you tremendously. Um, here it is. It's what I call investor identity um, because, I mean, some people call it investment philosophy 
investor profile, buying profile, all I've heard all kinds of terms uh, growing up in the business. And I call it investor identity. I call it that for a specific reason. Because one of the forces that our bodies, our minds, you know, fight to maintain is consistency with our identity. I mean, you could take, you know, a person who is used to an impoverished circumstance. And if so long as they are always identifying themselves with being someone impoverished, even if you change their surroundings, they're still going to do and sabotage whatever is around them to be impoverished. Uh, and vice versa. You could take someone who's always used to influence, uh, affluence, I should say, always used to succeeding, always used to these types of things, and you put them in a situation where there are adverse conditions and they're still more likely to cling to that identity and create in, around them a new situation that is successful, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So this same thing must exist everywhere we go. So you're in... We, you, listening to my voice right now, you have an identity. You identify in a certain way. There are certain types of real estate and investments that attract you for totally emotional reasons. And that's okay. Uh, you're not making a solely emotional decision. But some of the things that you, you need to be considering are things like time horizon. Meaning, when will you need the actual uh, benefit cash benefit in this particular case uh, from the investment. There's going to come a time at some point in the future when you need it. You need to understand when that is. Um, and more importantly, you need to understand when that is for the person or persons that you're also talking to. Some people have an immediate need, like right now today. Some people say, you know, uh, I don't plan on withdrawing you know, any money or using this for 10, 15, 20 years. That's, that's my goal. That changes the types of deal that you could be doing or should be talking to them about. Uh, next is financial targets. Some people need money today, uh, as I've said before, but that means they're primarily looking to influence their profit and loss statement. They're not overly concerned about uh, their balance sheet at this moment. Why is that important? It's because if you are selling a deal and trying to raise capital for a long-term project that's going to affect the balance sheet more than it affects the profit and loss statement, that could be the reason. It doesn't mean the deal's bad, doesn't mean you're bad, it just means you're not hitting their financial target, but you have to uncover these things to understand. Uh, another one that's very popular uh, for me is uh, social motivation. Uh, I tend to work in the affordable income, or sorry, affordable housing space a lot, and affordable is relative, right? Um, you could take a, you could technically uh, call a you know half million dollar house affordable because what we do as the landlord is we make it affordable by, for the renter so that they don't have to come up with half a million dollars to live there they only need two or three thousand dollars a month depending on your neighborhood but uh, when I say social motivation I'm I'm more talking about the tradition traditional sense of the word uh, affordable uh, as in lower income and that that has a lot to do with it sometimes. That could also be part of the reason why your investors would want to work with you. Um, you. But you need to make sure that your deal, that the marketplace, that everything is set up in place uh, to match that. You must be someone who is so motivated in that way. Uh, maybe there's a social cause that's on your heart. You're like, I just wish people would do this. You, uh, with that thought, are the one who's supposed to be doing it, by the way. And maybe your real estate play is to go get a building that can do that, and you run the building while someone else runs the business. Uh, a friend of mine, Josh and Lisa Lannon, have uh, perfected this, and they're uh, rich dad advisors. Uh, I don't know if you've picked up their uh, book, uh, The Social Capitalists, uh, but they have perfected this very, very concept and even written about it. So definitely something you probably want to go check out. Um, another thing to consider with the investor identity, identity is things like legacy conditions. For example, sometimes a deal is good for someone because it satisfies the needs of their estate plan, um, their inheritance, or their, you know, if they're trying to plan for their passing, 
Um, this is very, very prevalent when, and here's, here's a key also that helps you with negotiating. Uh, the individuals that I prefer uh, to deal with are those who have a significantly sized portfolio have been and landlords for a long time, but for whatever reason now they want to retire, whatever that means to them. Most of the time that means they still need a passive income and have a really, really heavy tax burden. But one of the unique things about real estate that I love is the fact that when you use seller financing, uh, you create a situation where they don't have to manage as much and they still can receive passive income. But more importantly, it is easier to for their heirs to inherit a note than it is to inherit a property. It's less stressful because they they have less moving pieces to the note. And I've found great success in looking for the individuals who are looking to do that uh, and being able to acquire their assets because uh, we love to make those payments. And again, many of you know I'd rather deal with people than a bank. And legacy conditions can be very, very key. Um, so you, you need to know that. Um, all of these things come down to the following question. Whom do you want to serve? And are you the best woman or man for the job? And as you continue to think about that and your investor identity, the more that that matches the deal and what it is that you're looking to do, and the more that that matches the marketplace and your team, uh, the more that that matches the person you're talking to, those other things become very, very real reasons why they will want to invest with you. Um, another thing that I find uh, to be very, very prevalent is... Uh, well, is a lack of asking for referrals. And I think this communicates a lack of confidence when you don't ask. It's a lack of confidence in your own service of what it is that you're providing. So uh, here's a script that I submit for your acceptance and use it as you'd like uh, to go out there and continually ask for referrals because I use it all the time. So I'm going to pretend that uh, Jane is who I'm talking to. Jane's the one with the money. And She's about to invest or considering investing. Uh, even in the first, our first sit down, these are, it's never too early to ask for a referral. <laughs> never too early. So um, I would say something to the effect of, you know, hey, Jane, uh, you know, one of the things that we love to do is we love to make sure that we take care of every dollar that's entrusted to us. And one of the ways that we do that is making sure that we pay 100% attention to the deal and deals. Uh, that we're working no matter where they are, no matter the location. And I keep my team and myself focused on those things. Your part in helping us stay focused on taking care of your money is to do the following. What we are asking for is that at some point over the course of us doing business that you introduce us to at least five more individuals like yourself. Because if we're out there marketing and spending all of our time doing those things, uh, we're not as able to take care of your funds, et cetera, et cetera. And we want to spend as much time as we possibly can making sure that what we focus on is taking care of you and your needs, as opposed to uh, always looking for you know new speaking engagements or classes to teach and things of that nature. Is that okay? And most of the time, they're agreeable, by the way, guys, to that particular exchange. And, you know, simply because we've asked, we get them. And when I feel like quality is slipping, we'll bring on a new person so that we can maintain our end of that bargain as well. So uh, that doesn't mean that's the only way we generate leads, but it is a, another way. It is a faster way. It is really good, especially when you're asking for introductions to five more individuals like yourself. Because if they're already considering doing business with you, and you've heard the phrase, birds of a feather flock together, this works very, very well. All right, uh, I've got about five more tips here. Uh, but before we do, uh, we're going to go over the cash flow question. So remember, uh, we are giving away an autographed copy of my upcoming book. Uh, it's <laughs> my cash flow creation system, how to create wealth in any economy. And it's just 10 steps. And we will definitely go through that entire process inside that book. Uh, it's expected to be about 300 pages-ish. And I'm looking very, very excited 
about that. So if you want to have an opportunity to win the book, what you've got to do is you've got to send in an email to cashflowquestion at cashflowdiary.com. That again, that's cashflowquestion at cashflowdiary.com. Send in the correct answer to the question and make sure when you email us, you've got to give us an address of where to send the book. Otherwise, it gets very, very tough to put it through email. (laughs) Anyway, here's uh, last week's question. Uh, It was, in your written contract, what is the more formal name for escape clauses? In your written contract, what is the more formal name of escape clauses? Now, Interestingly enough, uh, we did not get a correct answer, but we did get an answer that was close. We did get an answer that was close. The answer that we got that was close was inspection clauses. The words that we were actually looking for were contingency clauses, and inspection clauses yet one type of a contingency clause. However, uh, what we're going to do anyways, because since you got close, Sabrina, the book is coming to you anyway. So this week's question is, what is the name of the legal entity that is most often used by small business owners to control self-employment taxes? What is the name of the legal entity that is most often used by small business owners to control self-employment taxes? Again, email your answers into cashflowquestion at cashflowdiary.com. And don't forget to include your address so we can send you the book. And yes, please get the answer right. All right, let's get back to our main topic today. We're talking about how to get investors to believe in you and want to invest. Here are five more things that I want you to think about. Um, first, remember, because it's a sale, because that's what we were talking about before, it, yes, it's a sale, but because it's a sale, you must remember that integrity is everything. Meaning, do you walk the walk, talk the talk, and look the part? Um, if you haven't done it before, if you've never done what it is that you're attempting to do, tell them, it's okay. Don't, don't be afraid of that. They're going to sense that fear and, th- and think it's something else. So you might as well tell them. So maintain your integrity. Let them know. Don't be afraid to say, hey, this is my first deal. Because I was alluding to this earlier. It's not about you anyway. Making it about you guarantees that you won't succeed, in my opinion. That's the issue, is that I think think it's a very core issue. I think a lot of us, uh, when we're first starting, we're, we're just hoping we can get the deal and get someone to believe in me. And it's not just about me. It's about the entire team. It's about... Everything that's working with and behind me, uh, I love to let people know that I am the dumbest person on the team. Now, that doesn't mean I consider myself stupid in any way, shape, or form. I'm just the least knowledgeable. And if you consider me knowledgeable, then you can only imagine how knowledgeable my entire team is, from the CFO, the, the, uh, the VP of operations, the tax people, everybody, property managers, contractors, etc., that i that's what makes us great. And that's what you want to communicate. You want to communicate that your team is there and what their experience is. Um, And you want to have a system in place. So this is the next piece. You want to have a system and plan in place. You got to know the path you're taking your customer down and tell them it'll relax their nerves. It's like if you went to the dentist and they didn't talk to you, and they just shoved you in the chair, and then all of a sudden that drill came on, and you didn't know what they were doing, you would freak out, okay? You would freak out. But that's not how they do it. They sit you down, they talk to you, they tell you what's going to happen, and then they give you that lie. This is going to hurt a little bit, or you feel a slight pinch. Anyway, um, and they let you know what's about to happen to you, and it relaxes you. You've got to do the same thing. Next thing is you want to do what I call care frontation. Care frontation, not confrontation. You want to care frontation. You want to care front all of their concerns and possible concerns. If you're feeling uncomfortable for some reason, say it. If you're feeling, uh, if you think that they're feeling or thinking something that's going to kill the deal, say it. It's going to come back to get you anyway. You might as well say it now. Here, no, now. Because remember, It's ultimately your customer's problem that you are solving. They're not solving your problem. You're solving theirs. Could you imagine if you walked in 
Yeah, let me see. Let me put it this way. If you if you owned a, a fast food restaurant where you serve hundreds and hundreds of people a day, okay? Now, we're not going over the merits of fast food and all this other stuff, okay? Because I know some of you listening, you really like healthy food. That's fine. But just go with the example for a second. Imagine you own uh, this quick serve fast food restaurant and a customer walks through the door stands in line, gets up to the cashier, looks at the menu, and then changes their mind and leaves. But are you going to go chase them? Is it that big of a deal to you? No, because you know that there's another customer right behind that one. This is very, very true uh, for your real estate investing as well. There's no need to chase them because that, that person who walked out the door is probably still hungry. But you're not going to chase them down with your Big Mac and say, hey, please, please eat my Big Mac now. Then don't do that. Okay. Next, under promise over deliver, always do what you say you're going to do. I'm going to call you back. You better call them back. Be careful of the words and phrases that we use flippantly because they destroy trust. Here's a very simple example. Oftentimes, when you're passing someone on the street and you say, hi, But many of us follow it up with, how are you? But you keep walking. You don't stop to hear the answer because you didn't care. Do not ask questions that you don't want to hear the answer to uh, or that you not necessarily that you don't want to hear the answer to, but that you won't make time to stop and listen to. Okay, always ask questions that you're afraid of asking all the time. Those are good. But what I'm also saying is under promise over deliver. Okay, make sure like if you say when one of the things I often do with my deals is I'll quote a 20 percent vacancy on purpose. Now, uh, we're not shooting for a 20 percent vacancy. (laughs) Okay. however, if you like the numbers at 20 percent, I think you're going to like them, you know, more than that. That's the idea over under promise over deliver. And then also remember this. It's not going to go as planned and that's okay. Let them know you're going to stick in there and figure it out. That's especially true when you're new because that you can say things like, look, this is my, my first time doing this and or it's the first time we've worked with this particular group in this particular state. This is what I know. I know that there are going to be things to happen that I'm not sure what they are going to be, but that's what I do. I get to stand in the gap between what happens and your cash to make sure that what we do together is make is we figure it out okay and that happens more often than not now here's the good thing you're going to gain lots of experience you're going to gain lots of wisdom but most importantly you become a safer bet so long as you're willing to make those uh so long as you're willing to do exactly that so in closing today remember this Your expertise and the capabilities of your team is what you are selling in the marketplace. Your expertise and theirs was earned by mistakes, errors, and failure events. And being willing to experience those things and learn how to recover from them is a large part of what makes you and your team so valuable. Until next time. Thank you for investing your time with Jay Massey and the Cash Flow Diary. When you have a moment, please visit iTunes and leave a positive comment about the show. And go now to our website, CashflowDiary.com, to take advantage of our free business building course, Cash Flow Foundation. Gain the knowledge, understanding, and skill that will teach you how to never need a job again. Until next time. Until next time. Until next time.